Good morning and welcome to church. My name is Jeff Thompson and yes, you've come to the right place for All Saints Anglican in Nowra. But we decided we would start church down at our very special bridge or to be more truthful, our almost bridge or a little bit more accurate, the beginnings of the Shoalhaven Bridge. And so I've been very keen to get down here and have a closer sticky beak ever since Ian Deck explained to me how it's been constructed. So Ian's been in the bridge engineering game for some time. And he said that what they do is they start with a concrete casting yard at one side of the river. And when that first concrete is formed and set, they start to jack it over the river. They move it across. And so it starts to head towards that first staunch and they lay the next part of the concrete. And then when that sets, they keep jacking it over till it reaches the staunch and the second staunch and so on until it reaches its destination across the river. Isn't that amazing? And as I thought about that, I thought, well, there are some spiritual truths that we could learn from that. And the first is that God reaches out to us. God moves towards us across the great chasm of the cosmos and sin. It's not that I move first and reach out to him and find him where he's hiding with my intellect and my reasoning. No, God moves first in love to find me. And the second thing is it reminds me of scripture, the Bible. See, of course, the Bible didn't arrive in the hands of Adam and Eve as a complete story. It grew in stages, a little like our bridge again. And so I can imagine that when Moses was writing the first chapters of the Bible, as he was leading God's people from Egypt to the Promised Land, he must have been wondering, where is this all going? How is this all going to end? How is it going to come together? And of course, as the Bible moved across its trajectory, its storyline, we meet David. We hear the prophets reminding us that there is someone yet to come. And then we're introduced to Jesus, who gives his life for us on the cross, who rises from the dead to guarantee our resurrection, who ascends into heaven, but promises that he will return and fulfill his kingdom. That's the story of the Bible moving across history. And so, as we said last week, as we thought about heaven, the story of the Bible is moving from creation to new creation. But the purpose of that bridge, when it's finished, is not that we can stand back and say, look at us, we have a bridge. It's so what? That we can cross over. We can move from one side to the other side. And so too, God's word has a purpose. It's so that we can meet Jesus and move into a relationship with God by faith so that we can cross over from darkness to light and from death to life. So it's the story of the Bible. And the third way that I thought our bridge is a little bit like us is that sometimes we too can feel like a work in progress something under construction and like that first forming up of the concrete we can feel a little shapeless and a little purposeless sometimes and as we become a little bit like that road pointing into the air exposed to the elements and not seemingly going anywhere special we can wonder what it's all about but god is working behind the scenes He's strengthening us with his word and spirit and shaping and forming us in every life experience as we trust him. And he is taking us somewhere, a final destination which we know as heaven and we will be complete in Jesus. And as we think about ourselves as a work in progress, we naturally have to think about the church. The church is God's great work, and we are part of that. So let me read to you from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9. It is not by works so that no one can boast, 
For we are God's workmanship, created in Jesus Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And then from verse 21, speaking about the church, in him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too, are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. What gift of grace is Jesus my Church family, welcome back to Church Online. I'm Kaz and... I'm Ian. I was going to take it <laughs> off morning. you. <laughs> hey. Not going to take it off good you. Good to see you this morning, yeah. Kaz. How's your week been? It's been very good. I've uh, had a, a relaxing week, but a, a productive week, which was really good. How about yourself? Pretty good. Any sport watching? <laughs> I ended the grand final last night, yeah. I was going for the Demons. They won. So that's ah, good. The demons won. <laughs> I don't know about that. Well, we're starting a new series today in the book of Samuel, and um, the title for today is called The King is Dead. So tune in, kids, and tune in, families, for that one. Other announcements we've got? We've got a few announcements. Well, we've only got one announcement, so let's oh. uh, just throw to the announcement now. And it's an announcement about Offertree. So during this COVID time, it's easy to... Um, to get out of the habit of giving, but let me just urge you to continue to give and to fund the gospel work ministry here at the church and beyond. Um, it's good to do that electronically, um, and that's up there on the screen. But if you find that difficult to do that electronically for one reason or another, please just give the wardens a ring and they'll help you um, through that, be it giving electronically or other means. I'm going to read from the Bible now, and then I'll pray quickly, mm -hmm. and then I'll throw it back to you, so that'll be good. Let me just read from the Bible. This is a, a verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 6. It says, As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, In the time of my favour, I heard you. And in the day of my salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favour. Now is the day of salvation. Let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we come this morning to worship you, to listen to your word, and we pray that we will put all things out of our mind and we will focus. And we pray, Father, that as you bring your word, as your word comes this morning, as Jeff brings us your word, we pray that by your spirit, you'll give us wisdom and insight into the person and the works and the grace and the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we would submit to him in repentance and faith and that our souls would be restored and enlivened. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Mm. Amen. It's really good to pray together and restore. It's nice to refresh. And we're going to go um, live, hopefully, to the Rileys now. And there they are. Hi, guys. How are you? Hey, guys. <laughs> How are you guys going in lockdown? You've been in it for a while, haven't you? Yeah, just like a lot of people struggling with uh, school holidays in lockdown and working from home and just trying to bring all that together. Yeah, yeah. Um, can see you've got a, is that a Rabbitohs jersey on? <laughs> Absolutely. Sheridan, are you also a Rabbitohs supporter as well? It came with the wedding ring. <laughs> <laughs> I should be aware of that. I'll take note of that. Um, so that's good. At least it's not manly, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, can you guys lead us in prayer now? It's nice to see you guys. Sure. Love to. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, great indeed are you. You are exalted over all the nations. We praise and honour your great and awesome name. You are holy. You are mighty. You love justice. You show incredible mercy. We are a people of unclean lips and we live in a world despoiled by our sin and our rebellion. But through Jesus and his death, you have brought us, transformed us, and made us a new people for your glory. We cannot praise you enough for all the blessings you give. And above all, we praise you for the blessing of your son, Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Dear Lord, continue to give us, through your Holy Spirit, a commitment to holiness in our lives. We pray this particularly at this time of the pandemic, when fear, boredom, tiredness and frustration mark the days of many. Give us, we pray, a renewed sense of hope, perseverance, gentleness and holiness as if we await not merely the end of lockdown but your son's return. And Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for the end of this worldwide pandemic. As we do, we pray closer to home for our health workers and all those working long hours and enduring difficult days to sustain our community. We pray too that our federal and state governments would respond with wisdom, compassion and care with policies and solutions that hold our community together. Dear Lord, as we continue to see growing instability in our world and particularly our region, we pray that you teach us again to rely on you. We know, Lord, that you work out all things for the good of those who love you. Stay the hand of tyrants, provide peace and grace for the downtrodden, and raise up many who will follow a kingdom that is not of this world, but a kingdom of love and truth. Heavenly Father, we pray for Cheryl, Michael and Tessa Mark, grieving the loss of Cheryl's father. Be with them this week in your power and mercy, bringing them comfort peace and love as they remember him and care for each other. Loving God, you who are making everything new, bring healing and renewal to your people and answer these prayers we ask in the name of Jesus our Saviour. Amen. Amen. moment where there's a lot of grief going on and there's things behind the scenes that we don't see and sometimes we don't understand and if you're a kid and you're seeing people a little bit upset sometimes it's hard to process this so kids we're about to start the family spot with Emily and we also invited one of your rocklet leaders Kathy Green to share a story about grief so please enjoy this Welcome back to the family spot. Today we'll be listening to a Bible story from Kathy. She, as you would know, she's from the kids' church. She has the little toddlers. And we'll be listening to that, but there's a twist. In today's video, there will be two octopuses, mine and Jada's. Now there'll be a happy one and a sad one. So you have to find them both. Let's get into it. Helping me to do the things I should. So I'm going to read you a story, it's called The Heart in the Bottle by Oliver Jeffers. Once there was a girl, much like any other, whose head was filled with all the curiosities of the world. Let's have a look. Oh, she's thinking about whales and space and 
ships going over the edges of things, so many things going on in her mind. And she looks, she's sharing them with her friend. With thoughts of the stars. Look, she's lying down. It's so lovely to lie down at night and look up and see all the stars in the sky. So many, many, many stars. With wonder at the sea. There's so much in the sea. I love to be in the sea. She took delight in finding new things. Look, she's wading through the water. That's what I like to do. I go to the beach and I walk through the water and I like to find things like shells and starfish and all sorts of lovely things, sea urchins. And I think, look, she's drawing a picture of a whale. I think she's thinking about whales in the sea. Sometimes I've seen dolphins when I've been at the sea here in the Shoalhaven. Until one day, she found an empty chair. Feeling unsure, the girl thought the best thing was to put her heart in a safe place, just for the time being. So she put it in a bottle and hung it around her neck. And that seemed to fix things at first. Although in truth, nothing was the same. She forgot about the stars and stopped taking notice of the sea. She was no longer filled with all the curiosities of the world and didn't take much notice of anything other than how heavy and awkward the bottle had become. But at least her heart was safe. It might never have occurred to the girl what to do had she not met someone smaller and still curious about the world. Look, I think she's thinking that maybe there's elephants swimming under the water. Now that would be a strange thing to see, wouldn't it? There was a time when the girl would have known how to answer her, but not now, not without her heart. And it was right at that moment she decided to get it back out of the bottle. But she didn't know how, she couldn't remember. And nothing seemed to work. Look, I think she's tried hammering it She's tried getting a vacuum cleaner, she's tried sawing it, but her heart is still in that bottle. The bottle couldn't be broken. It just bounced and rolled. I wonder what she's going to do. It rolled right down to the sea. But there it occurred to someone smaller and still curious about the world that she might know a way. And it just so happened. She did. The heart was put back where it came from. And the chair wasn't so empty anymore. And have a look. All those amazing thoughts are happening now because her heart is back where it belongs. But the bottle was now empty. You know, sometimes some sad things can happen to us and our hearts hurt. And we might think we might want to put our heart in a bottle because it's hurting so much. But you know, it's really good when our heart is in the place where it belongs. And so we can enjoy being with other people and enjoy this wonderful world that God has made for us. Wasn't that a good story, guys? Should you do some like reading or should we do some of this? 
with some things you can do during the holiday. You should do some chalk on the driveway. You can do an obstacle course. Get your Bible, read a Bible verse story, whatever, and try and make out of straws the Bible verse. That's all for me. Oh, it's great. I'm looking forward to plenty of activities coming out of that at home. Well, it's, it's also good to listen to that story and be reminded that the Christian heart is, is alive and set free and satisfied only when it's back where it belongs. And it's focused on loving and serving the Lord Jesus. Well, we're going to uh, come to a time of Bible reading now. And uh, the Bible reading is from 1 Samuel, oh, sorry, 2 Samuel chapter 1. So get your Bibles and... Um, Open them up to, <laughs> to Samuel. And we're going to hear now from um, Gideon, who's going to bring us that. So, g'day, Gideon. How are you going? Good morning. Yeah, good morning. I got you there. Well, I've got to stand in the right spot too. Um, just, Gideon, just before we uh, hear from the Bible, um, how are you and Ivan and Jade are going in lockdown? How's it treating you? Oh, we're all good, thank you. Um, for us, not much has changed with lockdown. I'm a health care worker, so I'm still busy and working. And Elvan has the oldest and hardest job in the world, a full-time mum. Ah. So no pandemic can alter those responsibilities. Very good. Not easy in this time of lockdown either when you can't get out and about with yeah. those other groups. Yeah, so you're going to bring us um, the Bible reading now from 2 Samuel chapter 1. So could you read that for us? Verses, what is it? Yeah. Verses 2, verse 16, I think. Yes, the first reading this morning is from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 1, verses 1 to 16. 2 Samuel, chapter 1, verses 1. After the death of Saul, David returned from defeating the Amalekites and stayed in Ziklag two days. On the third day, a man arrived from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and with dust on his head. When he came to David, he fell to the ground to pay him honor. Where have you come from? David asked him. He answered, I have escaped from the Israelite camp. What happened? David asked. Tell me. He said, the men fled from the battle. Many of them fell and died. And Saul and his son Jonathan are dead. Then David said to the young man who brought him the report, how do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? I happened to be on Mount Gilboa, the young man said. And there was Saul, leaning on a spear, with the chariots and riders almost upon him. When he turned around and saw me, he called out to me. And I said, what can I do? He asked me, who are you? An Amalekite, I answered. Then he said to me, Stand over me and kill me. I am in the throes of death, but I'm still alive. So I stood over him and killed him, because I knew that after he had fallen, he could not survive. And I took the crown that was on his head and the band on his arm and have brought them here to my Lord. Then David and all the men with him took hold of their clothes and tore them. They mourned and wept and fasted till evening for Saul and his son Jonathan and for the army of the Lord and the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. David said to the young man who brought him the report, Where are you from? I am the son of an alien, an Amalekite, he answered. David asked him, Why were you not afraid? to lift your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed. Then David called one of his men and said, Go, strike him down. So he struck him down and he died. For David had said to him, Your blood be on your own head. Your own mouth testified against you when you said, I killed the Lord's anointed. Very good. Thanks, Gideon, for bringing us that. And please just keep your Bibles open there because the next reading follows on from that. But before that, we're going to just um, 
chat very briefly to Jeff. Jeff, we're starting a new series today in 2 Samuel, mm. but it's sort of a new series, but it's a follow-on series. Yes, so yes. W- where does it fit in for us? Okay, well, would you believe we've been in 1 Samuel, now to be in 2 Samuel, for the last three years, three, perhaps even four right? years. There you go. Yes, we do, just a little bit at a time. <laughs> yeah. And so we've been making this journey from... The big noise that God's people made when they said, we want a king. So the whole theme is Mm. looking for the right king, looking for the right leader. And so now we're going to learn that Saul is dead and there is nothing now between David and the throne. So are we at the right king? Good question. You're going to answer that for us, I'm sure. I think that's well, I we're, hope going, to. we're going to hear it over the next yeah. couple of weeks. I'm, I'm just engrossed in the uh, in the narrative of this story as well. It's just there's so much in there. Incredibly powerful yeah. if we keep our our minds attentive to all the little detail. Yeah, it's wonderful. I'm looking forward to it. So you're going to bring us that um, after this next reading. We'll do. Very good. Looking forward to it. Very good. Well, we've got the the second reading is going to be brought to us by Dre. Uh, g'day, Dre. How are you going? Hi, good thank you. How are you? Good to see you. Yeah, doing well. Just uh, just tell us how are you, how are you and Jess and Mabel going in this time of lockdown? We're good. We're good, thank you. We're just um, coping with trying to manage working from home whilst also managing a little baby girl that wants to to run and have her attention twenty four seven. So it's good, and um, it's not. We're excited to to um, announce that we're pregnant. Well, that is exciting news. Um, we're expecting well. a little boy at the end of the year, so. Ah, another addition to the church um, family. Yeah, so we just, we just uh, yeah, a lot of things happening all at once, so it's good. Yeah, very good. Yeah, and, and you're young enough to have the energy to do it too, which is wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Very good. Could you, um, could you read the second half of uh, 2 Samuel there for us? Sorry, yeah. I'd be delighted to. David took up this lament concerning Saul and his son Jonathan and ordered that the men of Judah be taught this lament of the bow. It is written in the book of Yasha. Your glory, O Israel, lies slain on your heights. How the mighty have fallen. Tell her not in Gath, proclaim her not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines be glad, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised rejoice. O mountains of Gilboa, may you have neither dew nor rain, nor fields that yield offerings of grain. For there the slain of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul no longer rubbed with oil, for the blood of the slain, for the flesh of the mighty. The bow of Jonathan did not turn back. The sword of Saul did not return unsatisfied. Saul and Jonathan, in life, they were loved and gracious, and in death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, Weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adored your garments with ornaments of gold. How the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. How the mighty have fallen. The weapons of war have perished. Well, as we open this new series on... uh from 2 Samuel, I want to ask the question, how are you dealing with Christians who have let you down in the past, who have hurt you, who have made your life difficult? Do you verbalize the love that you may not feel for them by praying for them? Or do you secretly wish them a justice, a justice on them, to counsel them perhaps? It ain't easy. Um, Sometimes the biggest hurts come from our brothers and sisters, the friendly fire. But let's not leave this question as a rhetorical question. We must examine our hearts for unforgiveness and the beginning of bitterness. Which is not the point of 2 Samuel, but it really is powerfully on view here. Because 2 Samuel opens with David learning that Saul is dead. The man who has made his life hell is gone and now there's nothing between David and the throne. David can now be king. But David grieves 
and he grieves genuinely. He grieves over the loss of a former friend. He grieves over the damage to the kingdom. And he grieves over the weight of failure of the Lord's anointed. So let's pray. Our Father, we acknowledge that we carry hurts even from those within the church. And we pray like David that we can surrender them to you and see your big vision of the kingdom, a kingdom of forgiveness and grace. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are in Samuel again, and over, as we said, the last three, possibly four years, we've been making the journey with Samuel the prophet, and Saul, who would be king, and with David. And it was all about being in search for a leader for Israel. Do you remember how it began? Here's a little recap moment. God's people told Samuel that they wanted a king like the other nations. Samuel felt rejected and God corrected that they're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me, God, as their true king. They're choosing to be like the other nations. Nevertheless, God gave them the king that they wanted. And so uh, the journey began with Saul. And Saul, as the new king, was charged with getting rid of the Philistines. And to a, a large measure, he did fulfill that. But he became more and more arrogant and trusting in himself. And eventually, he ignored the detail of a command that God had given him in a battle with the Amalekites. And so in 1 Samuel 1 uh, Samuel 15, we find that the kingdom was taken away from Saul. He was selectively obeying God. That can be a little like us from time to time, can't it? So God gave the kingdom to another, David. David was the anointed king elect. And this king would be a king after God's own heart, not just the people's choice. And so began Saul's jealous persecution of David, hounding him through the desert caves and forcing him to cross into enemy Philistine territory. And that's where we found him making a deal with the Philistine king Ashish. Even so, David never raised a hand against Saul or wished him dead. He understood that until his time came, that the life of the Lord's anointed was sacred. And the word the Lord's anointed or anointed means Christ, the chosen one, to do God's work, God's special work. So the idea of anointed is a really big deal for the people of God in Israel. Now, we've got one last recap to make, but before we do that, I just want to remind you the kind of literature that we're in at the moment. It's Old Testament narrative. It's not the wisdom literature that the Psalms is, or Proverbs, or even Job that we've been in recently, framed within poetry. The idea is that in Old Testament narrative, there is no such thing as an accidental detail. Even the most seemingly random detail is there almost like um, uh, signposts to help us reach the right destination in understanding the story, the author's intention. So for instance, we're about to meet a shifty Amalekite. And so we need to slow down there and understand why are the Amalekites of particular interest. And I told you some of those uh, reasons why. Because... While the Philistines themselves are an idolatrous nation and a thorn in the side of Israel, the Amalekites held this other significance. You see, when Israel were making their exodus from Egypt to the Promised Land, the Amalekites blocked them, would not give them permission to pass. So in effect, they were blocking God, blocking God's great plan. And so it's a sensitive national issue when it comes to the Amalekites. All right, so with that recap in mind and understanding how the Old Testament literature works, we now are on the hinge that turns 1 Samuel to 2 Samuel. 
the opening scene. Now, just last little recap, sorry. We closed 1 Samuel with David in a dodgy deal with the Philistine king, Ashish. Ashish had given him a town to live in called Ziklag, and Ashish believed that David now hated Saul so much that he would make raiding parties on his own people. And David did go on raiding parties, but not against his own people. It was against the Philistines. So what David was doing right up to the end of 1 Samuel was living a kind of double agent life. Well, finally, it came time for the Philistines to fight Israel. And David put his hand up to fight with the Philistine army. Now, whether that was a, a double bluff or not, not sure. But the Philistine generals did not trust him. And so they convinced King Ashish to send him back to Ziklag and wait till the war, the fighting was over. But when he'd gotten back to his town, Ziklag, he discovered that his family had been kidnapped by Amalekites and the families of his men. And so they had to pursue the Amalekites and to recover them. So that's the story so far. And that's how 1 Samuel ends. But just before it did end, the scene shifted back to this battle of Saul with the Philistines. But now, as we open the first chapter of 2 Samuel, we are with David in Ziglag, having returned from recapturing his possessions and family. And he's anxious to know how this battle is unfolding when who should show up but a young man who looks like he's come straight from the battlefield. Now bear in mind, as we've read the end of 1 Samuel, we know the narrator's account of how Saul died. And we trust the narrator. He's the biblical voice in this story. But this new guy has a different account of events. This man announces Saul and Jonathan are dead, which is correct. But our narrator has told us that the three sons of Saul are dead. This newcomer is only telling as much as he thinks will ingratiate himself to David. He knows that David will be the next king and that it's Jonathan who is the natural heir to the throne who has died. So that's why he's only telling him about that son. So David pushes this story a little further and he said, how, how do you know that they're dead? And the Amalekite says, I just happened to be there on the mountain where the battle was as its fiercest. And the next thing you know, Saul calls out to me. He's wounded. But before he tells me what he wants me to do, he says, where are you from? And I say, I'm an Amalekite. Now that doesn't seem to be a problem for Saul. And so he asks me to do a mercy killing, to put him out of his misery. And so I did, knowing that he was too far gone. David's listening to this story of the young Amalekite and he's starting to twig there's something wrong with this story. Would Saul really put his life in the hands of an Amalekite? So David's got to be wise now. He's got to be discerning. Is this a trick of the very much alive Saul who's trying to flush him out and across the border? Is this a trick of King Ashish maybe to test his loyalty? Or could it even be a trick of the Amalekites to ambush him. And we know something that David doesn't, and that is the armor bearer had refused to kill Saul, and so Saul took his own life, and the armor bearer also took his own life. So the Amalekite is lying. And the Amalekite then produces Saul's crown and his amulet because he stripped the body and is giving these as ingratiating gifts to David. 
It seemed like a plan to win over David since he would be the next king. This Amalekite is charming David for favour and position for the future. But David pushes him a little further again. And he says, where do you come from? And the Amalekite says, I'm an Amalekite living as an alien. So that means he was living as a citizen of Israel. And he could have well been in Saul's army. But then David says, didn't it occur to you that it was an unthinkable thing to touch the Lord's anointed? See, we know that Saul's armour bearer thought that way. He thought it was unthinkable to touch the Lord's anointed. We know that David felt the same way. He could have taken the life of Saul at several people. If anyone had just cause, it was David. And yet David believed that that was unthinkable. The life of the Lord's anointed was sacred. And so this deception of the Amalekite is exposed. He is a fraudster. And he is executed on the spot. The Amalekite gambled his hand that David would be blinded by his greed to rule. That he'd be happy to hear the news of this man. What a backfire. So we heard David saying, Your blood be on your own head. Your own mouth testified against you when you said, I killed the Lord's anointed. And with our sensitive modern ears, we might think that that's an incredible uh, overreaction by David to put him to death. But this deception was much more about God's honour that was at stake, even more than Saul's. And so the day becomes a day of mourning and weeping and fasting and tearing clothes. The king is dead. And no one adds the second part of that great refrain, long live the king. Not today. This is a day of great sadness. There's also something that John Woodhouse suggests we look closely at. One of those details that seems just a little bit incidental. John has written about um, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. And he says, have a look at chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Saul, David returned from defeating the Amalekites and stayed in Ziklag two days. On the third day, a man arrived from Saul's camp. We're pretty familiar with that phrase, on the third day, aren't we? The third day is a big moment in the story of God moving his salvation plan through history. We know it as the resurrection in Jesus. So what happens on the third day after Saul's death? A new king and a new future. What happens on the third day after Jesus' death? A new king and a new future. In so many ways, David will prefigure Jesus as a great king. And yet, although David will be great, we also know that his failures will be great. He's only ever a shadow of the king that we're really waiting for, the Lord Jesus. But as we close this first chapter on this third day, let's notice how David acts righteously, he acts wisely, and he is discerning. So firstly, he acts righteously. He doesn't vindictively rejoice over Saul's demise and death. He remembers the right kingdom order of things. Saul was the anointed. And for us, we have 1 Corinthians 13, love does not delight in evil but rejoices with truth. So this day for David and his men is a day to mourn over evil and loss. David acts discerningly. 
He very carefully interrogates the Amalekite. He doesn't fall for the deception when it would be all too easy just to to go with the vibe and race ahead of things. He slows down and he asks the right questions. And finally, David acts wisely. He's leading his men in a gracious and reverent response that will be widely known across the land when it comes time for the tribes who are loyal to Saul to give their allegiance to David. You might call that just being politically shrewd, and I guess it was, but David is helping his fellow Israelites make the right choice of the next king. And above all, he's setting the tone, respect and honour. So David, in this little story, is acting with righteousness and wisdom and discernment. But there's one more thing, and we have to notice that this is also a day of judgment. David delivers swift judgment on an Amalekite with righteousness and discerning wisdom. Folks, this is exactly how Jesus will return. When we talked about heaven last week, we said the first thing that Jesus will do when he returns and is revealed in all his glory is to judge the world swiftly and righteously. Do we expect this? Do we expect psalm 96 then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy they will sing before the lord for he comes to judge the earth he will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his truth when we think of jesus as savior do we expect a righteous judge or do we expect jesus the meek and weak One foot in the manger and the other at the cross. Now expect the judge of the world to come on the clouds. Do we expect hell to be as real as the heaven that we spent so much time carefully thinking about last week? It will be real. Or do we expect Jesus to make an embarrassed apology that his father, the king of glory, was just overreacting and that his holiness and our sin doesn't really matter that much after all? Friends, if Jesus does not judge, he is not good. We know he is good and he is righteous in every way, right in all his judgments. Or finally, do we expect that we can, like the Amalekite, deceive him in the moment, charm him, make excuses, tell Jesus just the things that he wants to hear? Friends, do not gamble that hand with Jesus. But remember that this great judge came into the world firstly as saviour to often a pardon from sin came as a saviour but most sadly turn him down friends i want to say to you this morning accept god's true king jesus accept the lord's true anointed one and as ian opened our service we thought about that saying from paul today is the right time today is the day of salvation. And our Father, as we go into our day, distracted by so many things, we pray that we can say, yes, today is the day of salvation, the day I put my trust in Jesus, the day I live in trust in Jesus. We pray that you would move our hearts, that you would challenge us, and convict us and draw us into the great salvation you offer us. Oh Lord, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Read ahead. This is a very special part of God's word. 
as we think about David. And Ian will pick up the story next week for us. And as you go into this day, we're leaving you with one last song to listen to and to just set your hearts um, in the right place for the rest of the day. And it's the same song that we played as we opened our service and we opened with a lot of local images and this is um, the group from Castle Hill called City of Light, Yet Not I, But Christ. Steadfast love, my dear.